Hi, I'm John Houck. Welcome to PDGA Sports coverage of the biggest competitive event in disc golf history, the 2000 Discraft PDGA World Disc Golf Championships. For the first time ever this year, the professional and amateur divisions were combined at one site, Ann Arbor, Michigan. Joining me this year is Director of Special Projects for the Professional Disc Golf Association, Dan Roddick. John, it is the Professional Disc Golf Association, but within its ranks there are thousands of amateur members. And over the past decade, the AM Championship has grown from under 100 to over 400 players at this year's event. With the pros and amateurs together, we had 821 competitors this year, and they came from nine countries. Over the next hour and a half, we'll show you what happened when the disc golf community came to six of Michigan's premier courses to compete for world titles and their share of over $100,000 in cash and prizes. The big questions this year, could Ron Russell repeat as champion? Would Ken Climo make a comeback to the top? Or could somebody else sneak in? Let's flash back to 1999 when Scott Stokely made this prediction for the Final Four. It, it seems that, that Ken Climo will, will be there as always, and I feel that Ron Russell, Barry Schultz, and myself have both all been playing solid. Turns out he was right on the money with all four, so this year we went back. Nostra Stokely, your predictions for this year? Uh, sure, that's easy. Ken Climo, Barry Schultz, and Isabel, and uh, for sure. Those four in the bank. Those predictions weren't too bad either. Let's take a look at the week and see how it went. Monday, doubles. This guy, Eric Tracy from Nolens, takes the open with fellow Southerner River Sherrod. The whole gang gathers under the big top tent for speeches and awards. The Hall of Fame tearfully inducts Tom Schott and Royce Rasinowski. Tuesday, these guys are from Taiwan, ROC. One of them, Len Yu Chen, ties for the lead among senior grandmasters in round one. Larry Leonard led the open, but Chauncey Donaldson had the hot round of the day, a record minus 16 at campground. After Leonard, it was Vokes and Russell in second, Collicutt in fourth, Chauncey, Barry, and 99 Am champ Schrader in fifth. Anybody seen Kenny? Wednesday. Juliana's four up on a lane. Master Myers made his move and the race is on for second. Disclife.com sets the new standard for world's web coverage. Barry misses a putt on the last hole, ties the monster record at minus 13. He's on top, Dr. Rick and hello, Kenny in second. Chauncey and Ron tied for fourth. Thursday, Juliana hurts her hand in the Hawthorne, loses five strokes in two holes, and Elaine is within three. Kenny and Ron catch the number nine train at the tunnel, as in minus nine, they share a new course record. But Kenny wants more, so he goes four down at Toboggan, another broken record, another broken record, another broken record. It's Ken, Barry, Ron, Rick, and the resurgent Randolph. Hey, Mikey, he likes it. Friday, this guy, please state your name. Rock Searle. Bangs back-to-back -back monster aces, have a cigar. Meanwhile, this woman, his wife Patrice, hot flash, grabs a piece of the lead in advanced masters she would eventually win. Tita takes over from Lori and her twin sister Caddy, while Summerfeld, and the living is easy, goes eight under at original and he's up by six. Ron Russell goes right, then he goes left. An injured throwing hand takes the current champ out of contention. Kenny's head of the class at Cass with a 49, his third record in a row. At the end of the day, it's Kenny, Barry, Mikey, Jesper, Rick, and Cam Todd. Everybody's back to the big top for the fly mark. Vendors report an unprecedented number of players replacing lost discs. When my game got hot, I heard somebody say, That gives you a little idea of the action that we've seen over the course of the week. This is the most massive competitive event in disc golf history. 
With 15 competitive divisions, the action has just been unbelievable. Now, nine of those events have finished this morning. We've got six more divisions to take a look at now. Let's check out some of the highlights. First, Dan, we're going to take a look at the Advanced Masters Division. Here's how we stand. Herschel Jones of Parma Heights, Ohio has a 14-stroke lead. So he's kind of just out here for show. Here's his drive on the first hole where he hit a little wood. This is Mike Coker in second place from Dayton, Ohio. Looks like there's a lot of wood out there. There is indeed. Here's Roy Carey from Darien, Illinois third place going into the finals and he's gonna try a little different flight path with more rough as the result and currently in fourth place Dave Nesbitt of Texas and that one is just about wood free these guys are all 40 years old or older this is the first year that the new age rule has come into effect what was it before that? It had previously been 35. So there was a, a percentage of the players who couldn't be in this division this year who might have been in there previously. As we see a par attempt there from Mr. Coker. And actually, even though some of these guys are a little on the older side of the field, they're not necessarily the most experienced. Some of them have only been playing for a few years but this division gives them a chance to be competitive at a high level as Dave Nesbitt makes his par putt that's the only par on the first hole but they did draw uh, 76 players in the division that's pretty big yeah that was a, a huge field and uh, <laughs> tell you the truth these guys are actually a little better than this I think they may have been a little nervous on the first couple holes well maybe they're not used to fairways like this either, John. I mean, geez, there's well, trouble certainly, everywhere. Certainly the guy from Texas isn't used to fairways this tight. But, uh, probably nothing too new from the uh, perspective of the Ohio guys as Coker hits wood again. And that's the uh, developing story here. Carrie and Nesbitt Tied now for third, both a stroke back from Mike Coker as we see Carey making his putt. Again, one of the things you'll notice as we go through these finals is the way that the rough is cut. A lot of times both sides of the fairway has a high rough as Carey hits a tree early here on the sixth hole of the final. Trying to hold on to third place. And as we watch them wrap it up here, nice shot by Coker. Where's Blair? And here's Carey. He's going to have a very long shot to try to save par, and he makes a nice shot of it. Oh, but that is nice. As it turns out, not quite good enough as Dave Nesbitt. Despite hitting a tree here, is going to move up into third place. Carey finishes fourth, and Ohio finishes first and second. Herschel Jones and Mike Coker on top. introduce to you the world's finest amateur women players from Michigan, Jen Kent. PDJ competition director Mark Ellis introduces the advanced women finalists. Jennifer Ketz of Ann Arbor in the lead. Barrett White. Barrett White is from Chicago, currently in second place. From Iowa, Des Redding. Des Redding is from Davenport, yeah. Iowa, the same state as Juliana Bauer. And from California, 
California, Leslie Harris. The reigning NorCal champion, Leslie Harris, is currently in fourth. She's from Grass Valley, and she's just one stroke behind Des Redding, and she is dead down the middle of the fairway. There's the second shot for Jen. She's got a 13-stroke lead going into the final. So again, we're not expecting much drama in the race for first. Barrett has a strong hold on second place. That looked kind of like an ultimate player. <laughs> she is actually an ultimate player, and I believe she's only been playing disc golf since April of this year. So she's pretty picked it up pretty quickly here as Des goes into the rough on the left. Great drive by Leslie. Not so good on the second shot. I think they may be a little nervous as well here, Dan. They're not used to being in the finals of the World Championships with a gallery like this. I think this is the first time really that uh, the timing has worked out to have such a, a good gallery for some of the divisions. Yeah, good job by the tournament staff to give each of these groups a little time on their own so they could develop their own gallery. And I'm sure the women appreciate it. Here's Des coming out of the rough now. A little straddle putt. Line was good, didn't quite have the distance. And now Barrett. Ooh, just a little on the right side. Let's take another look at that one. Just couldn't grab enough chain, but we talked to her earlier in the week about her ultimate background. Uh, I've played ultimate, ultimate for 12 years. 12 years, and what was it that got you switched over to, uh, or excuse me, adding on disc golf? Um, frustrated with ultimate, a friend dragged me out after practice and I got hooked. Got hooked, but you stick with the ultimate. Uh, it's good cross training for your golf game, maybe? Um, it's kind of good cross training. It kind of messes up both games equally. <laughs> Throwing a lid and then throwing a golf disc is a world of difference. Wow, what was it like for you being out there on your first world championships? Hard. It was a whole different kind of game than Ultimate. Ultimate is running and quick and everything's changing in a second. Golf, you throw a really bad throw and 10 minutes later you're still thinking about how bad it was before you can throw again. And now here is Leslie cleaning up her putt on hole number one. As does Jen. As does Des. And we'll move on to hole number two. They drew 27 players this year in this division. John, that's a pretty good uh, field. Yeah, absolutely. And it's great to see more women picking up the game. And obviously a lot of talent represented here in our lead foursome. Boy, she definitely throws like an ultimate player. A little bit in the rough there. But when you figure the short time that she's been making this transition, I think they better watch out for her. I think we're all extremely impressed as Dez gets a hold of one. This is 350 foot hole and she's gonna have a putt here. Got a very long, powerful stroke as opposed to Leslie, who's got a much, uh, much shorter stroke. I like the result out there pretty well. She'll be fine from there. Quick look at the scoreboard as you see the race for third still pretty tight. We move on to hole number six where Leslie is once again right down the middle and we had a chance to talk to her as well. What kind of advice would you have for girls who are just getting started at home and learning disc golf? Keep doing it. It's gonna hyzer but one of these days it's gonna go straight. It will. And that day when it goes straight will change your life, right? <laughs> Most definitely. Back now to hole number six. Jennifer is just off to the rough on the right a little bit. And Barrett is right down the middle, so they've obviously relaxed and settled in a little bit by now. With these courses, knowing them had to be a pretty big advantage. Well, that's absolutely true. And Jennifer, of course, being from Michigan, had the, uh, the best course knowledge. Although, with the length of some of these holes, uh, 
you're not going to see a lot of birdies out of this group, but if they can keep their drives in play and make good second shots, like that one right there, they're going to keep close to par and score well, and that's exactly what we saw from the top group here as Leslie is just about on the pin there as well. So Jennifer Katz is our champion. We got a chance to talk to her when it was all over. What was it like being out there with the women from around the country who were uh, trying to learn these courses? It was it was the best. Um, one of my favorite parts of being in the Worlds was being able to like look across the field and see other groups of women playing and that was amazing. You know, you just don't go to that many tournaments that you see women everywhere, you know, and ripping big drives, and uh, it was fun. It was fun. Good, and more fun next year. We'll see you in uh, Minnesota, maybe? So, I hope so. Okay, John, get ready to see the future of disc golf. We're looking at the men's advanced AMs. Leading the field from Ohio, Mike Subberfeld. And we're going to see some action out of these guys. They are young, they've got big arms, and they want to try to reach this hole. It's 395 feet, and they've got the arm, but it's so tight. Big hyzer shot for our leader, Mike Sommerfeld. But he finds the woods. Lee Rossbach. Lee Rossbach, Oak Park, Michigan. He's got a two-stroke lead on third place right now. Five strokes out of first. And right along the tree line there. Yeah, Lee. Yeah. 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 Nice drive. Yeah. From Minnesota, Curtis Gatlin. Now watch this. Left-handed, upside down, hook thumber. Oh my. Over the left side of the fairway. Oh my God. <laughs> Lands in the middle of the fairway and gets a good bounce. I'm sure the designer had that in mind. And also from Minnesota, Chris. Meyer. Two guys from Minnesota. That's the site of next year's Pro World Championships. And Chris is involved in it, actually. He's got a high enough, but not enough yeah. hyzer, so he's in the woods as well. And he's actually away, so he'll be going first. These guys have a lot of talent, but I tell you, this hole is so hard to birdie. And if you go for it, bogey is definitely a possibility. Very tempting shot. Here's Mike. He's got that uh, pro shirt thing going, the tiger look. Well, he's definitely going to be a professional. Actually, out of 263 players in this division, he's the only one who shot well enough to cash in the open division. So we'll be seeing him in the pro ranks real soon. And, and still in high school. Absolutely. 18 years old, still in high school. There's Curtis, who had the only birdie attempt on the hole. And as you see, he was a little off. All right, Lee. Good layup Good shot Lee. there yeah, Lee. for Lee to try to get his par. And Critter, good putt, just a little bit off. Just a little bit on the left side there. And here's Curtis for his par. Very good. So he's going to pick up a stroke on the first hole in the race for second place. As Lee misses his putt and takes a bogey again, just off on the left side. So second place, a stroke tighter there. And as we move on to the third hole, 480 feet, and look at Curtis. Still throwing his upside down throw on a wide open hole. He can throw it farther that way apparently than he can with a more traditional throw. I can't believe he's been using that through the whole week. His arm must be falling off. He should probably be looking at a pitching career. And there's another putt that just goes out for Rossback. And as we get to the tee on six, you can see that he and Gatlin are tied in the race for second place. So he needs to hold on here. And that is a, oh, good looking drive that just gets kicked out. Again, these fairways are so tight. I mean, it's, it's really demanding, particularly for these 
these younger players that, that may not have some of those things straightened out in their game yet. Well, and may not know how to resist the temptation to go for it all. This is yeah. another hole that's... Young, young drivers. Young drivers, yes, with higher insurance rates. Curtis... Fighting for second place, and look at this. I believe they call that a Norelco in Minnesota. <laughs> Slides upside down on the ice a long way during the winter. And here's Mike, our leader, out of the rough. That's a nice touch there. Very strong round for him. Actually, two under par, and he is our champion. We talked to Mike Sommerfeld when it was all over. How does it feel to be the man? Feels good. I don't know. I, it's the first Worlds I ever played. I just came in and played strong, played solid, played par golf. Had you ever seen any of these courses before? Oh, yeah. I've, I've played up here a few times in Michigan. I played for uh, NVG01 and New Fallen. No fool when I played up here. And how long have you been playing? Uh, about three years total. And uh, was it tough for you out there? Was it a yeah, little it was... nervous being in your first big Worlds? It was tough competition, yeah. It was pretty nerve-wracking in that final nine. And what do you think made the difference for you? Just playing smart, playing solid golf. And next year, perhaps we'll see you in the uh, pro division in Minnesota? I'll be there for sure. Absolutely. Congratulations, champ. Thank you. The PDGA is your organization. With the help of players like you, the PDGA continues to expand the growth of disc golf, bringing you more courses, bigger events, and better payouts. In 2001, disc golf arrives at the World Games in Japan, a first step toward the Olympics. With your help, we can continue to build on our successes. Please consider making a donation to the PDGA by joining the Ace or Birdie Clubs. And remember that PDGA merchandise makes a great gift. For more information, visit PDGA.com. Okay, John, now some oldies but goodies, the men's pro masters. from Maryland, Jim Myers. Jim Myers, Pokiesville, Maryland, goes into the final with a 12-stroke lead. So he's out there just for show. And you know he's loving it. it looks like some spin to me. From California, Glenn Treemstra! But we have a very tight race for second place. Right now, Treemstra has one stroke on Kowalski and two on Vanderboss. This will be the race to watch. Oh. Oh, this is not a good start. A local favorite from Michigan, Javier Kowalski. Oh. Javier, of course, knows these courses very well. Yeah. And he's looking to show it right here on the first hole. Vanderboss! 1995 World Master Champion, Bob Vanderboss, Millersville, Tennessee. Different look here. He is a lefty and he did not get that over. Darn righty hole. Here's somebody in the crowd say, darn righty hole. Again, you know, these guys, Dan, really got tempted by this hole. A very, very tough birdie, and if you go for it, the bogey is looking you right in the face, and Glenn's shot out of the woods, and he's not real happy. I think that gallery plays into it uh, somewhat. They want to show us something, they reach for it, and all at once they're, they're looking to save the par. Oh, and Bob goes oh. from one side of the fairway to another. Now, these guys are all good enough. They could par this hole anytime they want to, but they're they're taking some risks here. Well, not a bad save there for Jim Myers. Javier had the best drive out of the group. And a reasonable upshot. Trimstra is still in the woods. Good job. That one they like. Third shot for Vanderboss. That's a nice shot. Well done. And Jim for his par. He has had such a solid week. Very few rounds where he actually shot the best round of the group, but he never left the top. Just very solid, consistent play the whole time. And lots of putts that look just like that. 
Javier gets the lone par on the first hole. That will tie him with Treemstra for second place. And Vanderboss, two strokes back. Oh boy, that's a nice drive. Very nice looking drive on the second hole, 350 feet. Definitely within range for these guys. One big tree in the middle of the fairway. And that's how a lefty gets there. Moving ahead, we can see now that the guys have separated themselves once again. One stroke from second to third, one stroke from third to fourth, and a nice long roller by Bob Vanderboss. Oh, that was sweet. You know, a lot of these courses didn't have too many roller opportunities this year. No, and even though they're, as this hole shows, fairly wide open, there's uh, the rough is cut tight enough that if you want to put a roller in there, you need to uh, keep it in the short grass the whole way, and that's that's a real challenge. Oh, Javier would have liked to have that one back. Solid putt by Glenn, and at the 6T, see how it stands. They're still one stroke apart. As Jim Myers continues to enjoy his victory lap. Got it. Nice, Cap. Oh, I think he knows how to play this hole. And another roller Go! from Bob. Just caught a little bit of wood up there. You know, this is the uh, first year, Dan, as we mentioned before, with the age change to 40 this year for this division. We actually have a new trivia question. The only master world champion who didn't get a chance to defend his title. Uh, I knew you, you got me. Come you on. Got me. <laughs> who was it? Last year's champion, Jim Oates, oh, that's who right. is that's not right. 40 years old. He had to play in the open division this year. And Jim continues to cruise through. Well, he's got a caddy from Holland there, Arthur Haverkamp. Mm -hmm. huh, Streamstra just about put one in there. It is interesting that, that this division has had a history of really tight finishes recently. I know uh, last year that uh, sudden death playoff, this is the first runaway in quite a while. Well, and here's Bob who actually lost the title in that division in 94 in a sudden death playoff and came back very, very strong the year after. That was not a close race in Port Arthur in 95. He was really hungry that year. And he's looking to have to go uh, over the top and upside down again. Something I'm sure he's used to doing back on his home courses in Tennessee. All right. <laughs> the crowd appreciated that much, uh, that one very much. And here we go. Tied for second. Kowalski and Treemstra. Vanderboss one stroke back. This is actually, Dan, one of my favorite holes on this course. We're actually on the monster course here. Normally hole number two, 250 feet with several different options. You can see there's a little bit of a gap to the right, a little bit of a straight gap, and a couple of wide gaps on the left. And uh, plays well for a lefty there, as Bob shows us. Seems like a lot of these holes have some tempting options that have really big risks associated with them. And Glenn takes a different route there, and he's uh, close to the basket, but maybe in the rough. A lot of this rough really thick. Well, they have a new word for it. What do they call it? They call it <laughs> Shul, I Shul. think, is the Michigan word. I don't know if that's a new word or an old word. But that's like so deep, they say, that, that the chiggers can't get in. Yeah. <laughs> and Javier flirting with the uh, edges of the Shul there. And Treemstra had a chance to pick up a stroke. This is the eighth hole we're watching here. Mr. Myers with a birdie on that hole to increase his lead. Javier Pars. And look what we got. Three-way tie for second place going into the last Whoa. hole. 
Now the gap on this hole, as you can see, is on the right side of the fairway, so a good opportunity for a lefty to put one through there. But the basket comes way back to the left. So if you want to get to the hole, it's a lot easier for a righty to put one over the top, have it fade back in. That one did not fade back for Myers. Trainster is a little low. Oh, and he may be near the OB there. Actually, OB Creek bed down the middle of this fairway. That looks right. Working, 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 working. And so Javier will have an opportunity to take second place all by himself if he can cash in on that one. Jim Myers doesn't care. Trimstra did avoid OB. Yeah. And got a nice kick. He'll have a tap in par. Oh, Jim's drive sailed way right. Comes in with the upside down approach. He's up That's right. He's got enough Shy. space to work in. <laughs> a little too much. Uh, My Bob is way up there. I didn't realize he was so far off the line. Well, and if he puts this in, he could get second place by himself, but he's going to play it safe there. Javier now to take second place. All to himself. Not play. <laughs> that would have been a nice one to have. There. And Jim Myers looking to finish it up. It's home. It's official. New master champion. <laughs> <laughs> like he'd been holding that in for a while. He is a happy guy. Thanks, Bob. Bob. Great tournament for Jim No Spin Myers. Hope he's doing well. Thanks, What's up, Bob? Javier gets his par. gets his car. And Glenn Trinstra gets his car. So we finish with a three-way tie for second place. Great round by Bob Vanderboss. Shot one under in that round to tie it all up. And we're going to have a little uh, closest to the hole contest here. I, I assume, Dan, that they're going to split the money and that they're just uh, oh, for the, this is for the trophy. shooting here for the trophy. So... It's a good hole for uh, Bob. Absolutely. A little uh, extracurricular here. Oh, looks like a good hole for Javier, too. <laughs> so, as it should be, the local guy. With the CTP in place, that will do it for our master division. High fives around, and there it is. We had a chance to talk to our new champion, Jim Myers. Well, the, the game is mostly in the head, so I have basically got my head farther together than before and just played smart on the difficult holes and grabbed the birdies where they're available. And now, Dan, the pro women, Mark Ellis, tell us who they are. We have in this round the finest women golfer in the world. From Iowa. Juliana Bauer! Yeah! Juliana is from Indianola, Iowa. She is the two-time defending world champion. She goes into the final nine with a seven-stroke lead on her closest pursuer, Elaine King. It's interesting that she is so smooth, but she's very quick. And that's how she gets that arm space. Right along the right side of the fairway, and I think she's going to be in good shape. From Canada, Elaine King. <laughs> Elaine has five world titles, including four in a row from 1991 to 1994. Still the record in her division. Ooh, and she missed the fairway pretty badly there. 
Annie is perennially in the top five at the World Championships. And a former world record holder in the women's division for the distance throw. And from Florida, Deb Renner. Deb Renner has had a tremendous tournament, solid play all the way through. Impressed a lot of people and made a lot of friends this week, and she is right in the middle of the fairway. As we get a good look at this record crowd, no parking spots available today. Elaine had to dump out uh, from the woods there. Well, she probably could have made a run at it if she wanted to, but... She is the queen of course management, playing very smart there. Annie actually was kind of going for it, and I think she put herself back in trouble. If I'm not mistaken, Elaine is the only PhD in our final four here. I think that's true, and there's a I think it's that approach shot that really has been the key to her success. She is extremely consistent and extremely accurate. And these are the kind of courses that really will reward that kind of play. You can get in a lot of trouble taking risks. And a steady player is going to come out on top a lot of the times. Which is not to imply that Juliana is not steady or consistent, because she sure is, and she puts that one right up by the basket. When you're on the top of a contest like this one with the six courses over virtually the entire week, right, some watch. good things are going on in your game. Annie has put herself back in the rough, and that's on the right side. She is back in the rough on the right side of the fairway. But Gave it a shot as Juliana consults with her caddy, Sean Sinclair from California. And here's Annie again. In the moderately deep rough. I don't know that that necessarily qualifies as shul. Oh, not quite. But a good run and Annie will finish up with a five on the opening hole. There's Deb from the edge of the rough. I like her approach to putting. She really looks like she's intending to make each time. And make she does. Juliana will have a drop in par. <laughs> Elaine will have a drop in. And we move on to hole number two. There are the scores going into the second hole. This hole is 350 feet which is certainly in Juliana's range. Good look at her footwork there as she launches one oh, just about in the heart of the tree and takes a little kick to the left. Now, Deb. She is going to miss that tree. She's got a good pull, and if it comes back, and it does, she will be looking at a birdie attempt. There's a lane with that shoulder scrunch that she does before she throws. Good power, but, uh, well, didn't quite get it up. I think she's looking a little tired from the, the week. It just That's not the kind of snap you normally see from her. Well, it is a, a long week, and we have a beautiful gallery here watching the women, probably the biggest in their experience. Well, that was one of the benefits of, of having the pros and the hands together, and, and the fact that the other divisions could uh, get to watch this. And we talked to Elaine about that. I, I love talking to women who are new to the sport, because uh, I can completely relate. I remember back when I was a beginner, uh, how it felt and how exciting it was and how intimidating it was to watch the top women players and uh, can just see myself in so many of the women that I met this weekend. Here 
Here's Annie now with another sidearm attempt. And that. Oh! oh. 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 I guess she is. Did you see that? Juliana coming across the trees. It's about the only tree trouble on the left side of this hole, and a birdie attempt now for Deb. Just a little left, Stay but a uh, good effort. And here she is now for her par. That is money. And Annie is in as well for her par. Annie has has never won the, the World Championship, has she? I know she's been in the running what many many of the last well few she's years. always near the top her best chance was in 1995 in Port Arthur where she went into the last hole uh, with a lead and unfortunately her drive found a little water but other than that with the exception of uh, Beth Tanner in 1996 I believe this entire decade has been dominated by two women, Elaine King and Juliana Bauer, and Juliana is long and straight. This is a 480-foot hole, not really within uh, anybody's range to birdie this hole, so just looking to scrunch and then uh, put one down the middle, take your par. There. Yeah. <laughs> but it came back, she's going to be okay. Now Annie, who certainly has the ability to put it out there. <gasps> yeah. 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 And just on the edge of the rough to the left. So. Good look at our leaders coming down. Really interesting again, the different styles of play and the different strengths that we see here. Juliana, of course, has the, the big arm, uh, as does uh, Annie to an extent. Elaine, uh, although she can put it out there, I think her hallmark is consistency, and we've seen a lot of consistency out of Deb this weekend. And there's another example. That's really what makes the game interesting. There's so many different ways to get it done, and, and the strategies are so obvious. Juliana manages to look extra graceful even on a reasonably short approach shot. And Deb oh, yeah. is down the middle once again. Good She's a putter. She's a putter, I'm telling you. She's really solid. Par for Annie. And Juliana and Elaine will clean up their pars. Now one of the undercurrents that's new this year, Dan, that we haven't talked about is the chance for these players to help their countries qualify for the World Games in Akita, Japan next year. I know you're very involved with that. What's actually uh, involved here in getting these women to Japan? Well, the, the first step here at the championship is to qualify the, the various nations for participation. And uh, the women's division is a big part of that. And it, it appears uh, certain that uh, U.S. And, and Canada will be qualifying and largely uh, on the backs of uh, Elaine and Juliana as they've done so well. And in turn, uh, each of them are leading candidates to actually be the women representing those countries uh, in Akita. So once the, uh, they do well enough here and their country qualifies, but that doesn't mean that they have necessarily qualified. That's correct, but as, as you've pointed out, They've both been so dominant in women's play that uh, they're obviously the, the two strongest candidates. So this is a very important stepping stone in the history of disc golf. For uh, disc golf and actually ultimate to be a part of the World Games, which is pretty much one step below the Olympics. Right. Uh, especially just recently, the Olympic Committee and the World Games pointed out how closely they're going to be cooperating in the future, so it, it is a great opportunity for us. 
So it could be that uh, disc golf and or ultimate a demonstration sport yeah. in the Olympics and that's the kind of demonstration we'd like to see. Beautiful long putt from Juliana. Let's take another look at that one. Look at the form, the line, the pace, the accuracy, and a nice birdie there for Juliana. And Deb saves her par. What were we thinking were the strengths of Juliana's game? <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, any anytime somebody drives that well, it's easy to overlook their putting game. But she uh, absolutely is a rock-solid putter. Now to hole number five. As you can see, 290 feet. It's actually hole number six off the original course, over a valley. That graphic, yeah, doesn't show the real problem there. The the elevation drop and gain is is really a critical part of this hole. Yeah, there's really not much difference between the tee and the basket, but it's a big valley to carry, and if you're not long enough, you've got a lot of uphill to negotiate. But uh, more so than that, this is a very tight gap that they're trying to hit, and significant rough on each side. Oh my. Come on, after a couple of drives. Oh, no, Andy got a nice kick back to the middle. That was not turning over for her, but... Elaine was on the left side of the fairway, as was Annie. Up the hill, and ooh, she made a run at it. But she's a little deep. Similar shot here for Elaine. And she's right there. It's like Deb has a sidearm coming out of the rough. We ain't got a little tree help. Juliana has the lone shot at a birdie, and it's oh, just about. Annie to save par. Hmm, not quite. So Annie will take a bogey, and Elaine actually took a bogey. <laughs> and that's where we stand as we go into hole number six. 450 feet, a very hard right to left turn. Rough on each side of the fairway. And Juliana's pulled that far, but a little offline there. I think that'll be all right. Oh, look at this. That's sweet. Very nicely played. Again, this hole is not really in anybody's birdie range. They just want to set themselves up to oh, yeah. the second shot. And Elaine lane has certainly done that. And Annie's coming back. In the rough, just on the edge of the fairway there. Nice looking second shot. Oh, that was a good reach. She is buzzing that basket. Meanwhile, Elaine, dependable, predictable, and reliable under the basket for an easy three. There's oh, oh, just an awesome. shot. That was a good set of approaches. There's Juliana coming out of the rough. She had a little problem with rough earlier in the week. We talked to her about her injury. I put myself in the middle of a hawthorn tree bush and my only shot was to do a sidearm back out behind me and so I was throwing and didn't realize that I was going to be throwing right into a limb and lodged a hawthorn needle about a centimeter into my bicep. Looks like you still got a little uh, after effect there, a little, little damage and a little bruise. How long did that last and did it affect your play? It definitely affected the next two holes. Um, more mental probably than physical. I was worried that it might have uh, longer effects, but it, it didn't at all. Um, that particular hole happened to be very bad. I took a seven on that hole. Uh, three putted, three putted the next hole for a five. Uh, but other than, after that, we only had three holes left. They were fine, and it didn't affect me the rest of the tournament. Good 
On now to hole number seven. Can't see the basket. It's, it's tucked way back to the right there, but if you can see the hill out there, there's a small opening in the trees about even with that hill. Can they reach that gap, you think, enough to, to actually go down in from the tee? Well, I think it's probably long enough that the gap might be reachable. And Andy's going to take a shot at it with a turnaround. Distance champ, come on. Even she's right. right at the end. She got the gap, but to, to get into the gap and to the basket, that's a tall order. But that's how you do it on your second shot. Deb set herself up to where she's got a pretty good look at it. Juliana looking straight ahead at the basket. And she puts herself right there. And there are our scores as we head into the eighth hole of our final. 250 feet with options right, straight, left, and wide left. And Juliana goes for a wider right. shot, but hits a tree and kicks her out. Same line for Elaine. With a little better success. Deb takes it up the middle, a little bit of turn. She's going to like that. And inside. Well, uh, that's not the right angle for the inside route. Tough one for Annie there. We move on to hole number nine, the last hole, 400 feet. So Juliana might have a shot at that. You see a big S curve if you want to go for it on your drive. It's got to go way left to right and then come back. Oh, that looks like it's a candidate. Get it. Come on, sure work. Come on. Wow, that's, that's In fact, Dan, I, I think we saw a birdie on this hole in the last hole of the mixed pairs as we watched Deb. Well, she pulled it a little bit, but she had a great week, and we talked to Deb about her experiences in Florida. Yeah, we have Sarasota Sky Pilots. We have over 350 members, and uh, the club is great. It's mostly amateurs volunteering their time, pros volunteering their time, and just making the club work. Um, we're local, but we have a lot of people throughout the state of Florida. We help other clubs. We now have a fabulous Florida tour going on. It's killer in Florida. So I don't travel that much. Some, some people might not know me, but I'm in Florida. And uh, I'd love for you to come down and see me. Now there's, there's a different approach. Elaine just plays it nice and safe. She doesn't... Doesn't really have the arm to birdie this hole. She's going to play for her three. And look at oh Annie. My. That was nice. She knows that. Juliana to finish the week. Is that bird, come on. Oh, wow. Well, that would have been a nice way to finish, but might as well make it last a little longer. Deb for par. Solid putter all day. Oh! Gets well, she gets to play a little longer. Seems like we see that a lot. People having trouble cashing in on the final holes at the World Championships. Not Elaine. She's ready to be done. Bang. And done she is. Second place this year, Elaine King from Etobicoke, Ontario, Canada. Third place goes to Annie Kremel of Canyon, California. Fourth place to Deb Renner of Sarasota, Florida. And fittingly, the last putt will come from our now three-time Women's World PDGA Disc Golf Champion, Juliana Bauer. Three 
Well, there's going to be a lot of hugging and handshaking for the next several moments. Everyone wants to Sorry. congratulate our champion. There's Mark Ellis, the PDJ competition director, whose voice we've heard oh, this afternoon. <laughs> and looks like Juliana's even going to do some interviews. <laughs> Juliana, did you expect this kind of reception when you first got here last week? No, no, the crowd has been uh, incredible. And we managed to interview her ourselves later on. And here she is, Juliana the Champ. Very good. Now you and Elaine had been going back and forth in tournaments the last month or so. What was the difference this week? Uh, the courses maybe favored me a little bit, uh, like the toboggan course, a little bit longer. Um, I, I don't know. We we have been close lately, and it's it's been nerve wracking. Everybody else is saying how excited it is. You know, I personally would rather not have the excitement, um, but. Uh, it's just been a great competition between the two of us, and, and I just happened to come out on top this time. Well, a little on the modest side there. What do we have to look forward to in the next few months? I'm, I'm going to stay on tour a while, and um, I guess my, my next big event is the U.S. Open. Oh, down in Charlotte. Yes. Very good. Well, another great championships. Congratulations. Way to go. Thank you very much. Nice job. Hi, this is Jim Kenner, president of Discraft title sponsor of the 2000 PDJ World Disc Golf Championships. I'd like to take this opportunity to thank the PDJ, Team Michigan, and the many volunteers who helped make this exciting event possible. At Discraft, we have a full selection of golf discs, including the Elite XL, the current world distance record holder, thrown by Scott Stokely, 693 feet. And we've just released the Elite XS, which Scott says he's going to break the 700-foot barrier with. Discraft, the world's finest golf discs. And now, John, the, the highlight, perhaps, the Pro Open. There are the standings as we head into the final nine holes. And to introduce our players will be the PDJ Administrator, Brian Henniger. Introducing for, uh, first of all, in fourth place at minus 44 under, a previous World Master and World Grand Master Champion at the youthful age of 51 Woo! playing in the Pro Open Final from Bowling Green, Kentucky, the amazing From Olympia, Sweden, last year he came in sixth place in his first world championships. He's only 19 years old. He's got future world champion written all over him. Ladies and gentlemen, please give a big round of applause for Jesper Lundmar! Yeah. In second place, one of the game's classiest acts from Sheboygan, Wisconsin, this year's Masters Cup champion. He's won many Super Tours the last two, three years. Big round of applause from Sheboygan, Barry Schultz! Last but definitely not least, the nine-time world champion nursing a nine-stroke lead at 62 under from Clearwater, Florida, Kenny the King! Okay, so we're ready to go. Here's another look at hole number one. Again, at 395 feet, these guys have the power to reach the hole, but it is almost impossible to birdie. Incoming. Can they really power it through down at tree level, or do they have to? They have to be up above it. Really. Nice. I would think uh, maybe a lefty might have a chance of going through at tree level and letting something s back, but uh, just brutal for a righty. At the same time, these guys aren't about to put a 250-foot drive out there and play for the easy par. But, money, 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 money. <laughs> as we've seen before, they go for it and they miss the fairway. It can be a lot of trouble. And here is Jesper Lundmark. And there is the first kiss of the disc that we'll be seeing all afternoon. If he can hold on to third place, that will be the highest finish ever by a non-North American player. 
Uh, and coincidentally, the best finish previous was fourth place by Svante Eriksson, who's from the same hometown, Sheleftia in Sweden. And the amazing Dr. Rick at 51. We used to play even, John. It's really discouraging. <laughs> well, you know, this year he qualified to play in the Master Division, and he qualified to play in the Grand Master Division, even with the age going up. But he stayed in the Open, and he has had a tremendous week. Well, of course, you know, a number of years back, he opted for the Masters division uh, when he became eligible, played such great golf that he actually would have won the Open. Right, that year he won in uh, Cincinnati, maybe? Yes. Got one right. All right, Barry putting the knee on a towel, which, by the way, you can do in disc golf. <laughs> You're out of there when ball golf. And that's a good looking shot. A little, a little short maybe, but well within Barry's range. And this is what we've seen from Rick all week. Safe on the drive, close on the approach shot. And he is extremely patient. He'll take his pars when that's the best option. And there's Jesper with the kiss. Every shot, John? I think pretty much every shot. Decent shot for him. Ken actually had a real nice drive. He's out in the middle. Let's say uh, in the 60 to 70 foot range. So a legitimate shot at what would be the first birdie of the day here. Mm, and just about. So he looks at that and figures this is going in most of the time. This year especially, his putter really came alive in the last few rounds. Uh, Actually, Barry Schultz, who makes his par here, never got below second place all week once they put the pools back together. Uh, had first place for a while, there's the kiss. Dropped down to second, and it was only when Ken's putter really came alive that, that he was able to put some distance between him and Barry, as Jesper buries his par putt. And Dr. Rick will take his par. Uh, it was very, very close between Ken and Barry all week, and Ken had three consecutive course records, and that's what it took to put him in the lead, because Barry was still playing great the whole time, so. Here now will be Ken on hole number two, 350 feet. Really only one tree to contend with, but it's caused trouble so far today. But this is certainly a hole that these guys would expect to birdie. Ken's keeping it low. Oh, oh my. A little to the right. We haven't seen that tree hit yet, but that's going to take him out of birdie range. Now, Barry. Well, we saw a number of the other divisions try to solve this hole earlier, and they really weren't able to do it. Well, they should have tried it that way. <laughs> that's nice. Barry's had a tremendous year. Four Super Tour wins to this point. No one has more than that. Ken also has four at this point. As we see Jesper, a little bit to the right, obviously using a nice overstable disc. And he's even closer than Barry. Take another look. He sends it out to the right just about flat, but his overstable disc just fades right on to they made it look pretty easy, actually. Yes, indeed. And Dr. Rick, while he doesn't have the gun. Yeah, he's got to be down on, on power. A little tighter line. Pretty much straight at it. Actually kind of wow. went under the basket, but he's definitely in, in his range there. He wasn't giving up too much there. So Ken is actually the only one who uh, will be laying up, although he gives it a little run. got to be Rick's story there. I mean, a little bit off of the drive length, but still well within his range. I'm sure he makes up a lot of strokes with solid putting, but I think course management more than anything else, which is something that you really needed this year, especially compared to last year at Chile, 
when the fairways were more open, um, players get punished a lot more at these courses here. Look at that gallery, John. Really packing in for this fun. So here we go to the third tee now. This is original hole number four, 480 feet. And for the first time today, we're going to see players who actually will have a shot at reaching this hole and making a birdie. We saw Barry last year get to a 911 foot hole in two shots. And he's got tremendous distance on that but a little offline. Here we take another look. Barry's got a big hop in his step. He gets going pretty early. Long reach back. Keeps it nice and low. Real strong right through there. Just right through the chest with a lot of power. Keeps his upper body down low on top of the disc. And it doesn't get much better than that. Although I think if anybody here has a little more arm, it's going to be this guy. So sweet. Nice. Yeah, he's falling off a little bit too, but he had great distance on that. He stays a little lower throughout his swing, but look at the backswing. Way back, elbow bent, big bend at the waist, and all that power coming right through the swing. You think Rick's got it to, to reach this? <laughs> Rick. To, oh, oh. Yeah, yeah. hello. Oh. Rick doing his best Gerald Ford imitation there, <laughs> <laughs> picking off the spectator. Take a look at this. I I think he meant to go that way, but maybe a little higher and more angle. And by the time this poor woman, the guy in front of her, goes down. Now he is a physician. You don't think? Well, no, <laughs> no probably. Somebody not. in the gallery actually said, "Don't worry, he's a doctor." But watch, the guy in front goes down, and this poor woman has nowhere to go and no time to react. Oof. Fortunately, he doesn't throw as hard as the other guys, I guess. But she was uh, fine, of course. A short-lived souvenir of her world's trip. Wow. Oh, <laughs> oh, thank you. Sometimes it is better to be lucky than good. He's um, actually got both of those going. Well, nice. sometimes it seems like the better players get the best luck. <laughs> I don't know how that works, but he, uh, he comes down right in the middle of the ferry. Now, look at Ken. He actually starts off the pad a little bit, comes in at a little more angle. He's got a good hop going there. He doesn't get as much of a backswing as the other guys, but he comes through just as fast. And definitely... a. Uh, a swing worth emulating for the younger yeah, golfers yeah, out there. Come on, get on it. But that'll, that'll, that'll play. Do you see how simple that motion is? I mean, it's there's just nothing going on in that. It's just a pure pull. Rick has by far the most compact swing out of all of them, and that uh, may not give him the distance, but he sure has the accuracy. So Ken will look to lay up again for a par. Barry just uh, a little bit out of putting range here, so he's going to play it safe. There's the kiss, and Jesper, oh, almost got himself a birdie on a 480 foot hole. So we will clean up pars around the horn here. Barry, Jesper, and Dr. Rick. Now to hole number four. Three hundred and sixty-five feet. And Barry up first. This should be in Barry's range, shouldn't it? Which is a little bit of tree. Did you see the kiss? Yeah, yeah, I did catch that. I think it's pretty much been every shot so far. Nice and smooth and straight. Wow. Hit the tree as well. Take another look. You see, these guys are, are trying to go in the gap between those two trees. 
certainly a makeable shot for them, but I'm kind of surprised with uh, their power that they don't go for the big wide shot all the way around the right. And Dr. Rick, boy, he's going to make some more new friends over there. <laughs> Now a lot of the gallery will get to meet Dr. Rick up close today and here's Ken and that tree apparently has the disc magnet working as it takes another victim. Well, that was a little bit short. I think he might have got a little tongue on that one. <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't going to go there at all. Uh, the Al Gore approach. Good shot by Jesper. Dr. Rick from the cheap seats. Yeah. Oh, gave it a shot. It does, doesn't it? That was an approach shot. Oh, not quite. That's how he got to be the nine-time champion. Well, especially, especially this week, it just seemed like every time he had an opportunity to can a critical putt of that length, or, or even, even twice that long, he, he collected. Yeah, when, when he had that course record round at Toboggan, he just about couldn't miss. Didn't really matter the length. He was just really in the zone. As Dr. Rick takes his par. This guy with the basket on behind him. Uh, I hope they're not <laughs> putting at him by mistake. Not, oh! Jesper will take a bogey, and that will uh, bring Dr. Rick to within one stroke of third place now. Okay, we'll see how Jesper does with a little bit of heat here. Could turn out to be a costly one for him. There's a look at the scores as we move on to the next hole. Original hole number six, 290 feet. So this is the one across the valley. Well, they've all got the power here now, but still, it's such a narrow gap up right at the hole. A little turnover. Into the side of the hill and skips up. That is a multiple cut for sure. You know, that's really one of the things that's typical about these courses here at Hudson Mills in particular. Oh, as Rick gets a bad kick. Um, a lot of holes that are cut through the woods where you're forced to throw a right curve or a left curve and not a lot of margin for error. You really had to have all those shots in your bag to do well. And Ken shows us that he has that one. Well, did you notice he went straight at it? And the other two threw roll curves more like this shot. Well, that needs to turn oh, over, my. but it doesn't. He has the power. But, but Ken really went straight at it. And there was no no roll curve out there and and to a certain extent he was able to minimize some of his risk that way i think but it took a lot of power all right dr rick now is this properly called shul here that he's in or uh, i think mild? that's that's on the edge of the shul okay you might need to get a clarification on that one but anyway he's looking i mean he Look, is visible watch him uh check his angle there he doesn't need a lot of speed on this one. And the gallery is happy with the result. Uh, Jesper, just about in this bush, and I don't think he can actually see the basket from where he is. But he's not, uh, not more than 50, 60 feet. Oh, and he hit the pole. Nice try. shot on a hole that's been a nightmare for a lot of people through this week. And 
birdie for Barry as well. Par for Dr. Rick. So nothing changes in the race for third as Dr. Rick and Jesper both take pars. On now to hole number six. Four hundred and fifty feet, but again, a lot of curve on that one. These guys actually will have a crack at the birdie here if they make a perfect drive. But thick rough to the right and the left. Barry goes tight on the left side, tight on the right side, and winds up with a putt. Yeah, that was nice. That was so low. I mean, we really had to penetrate through that. Can't do much better than that. And I'm going to guess Dr. Rick's not even going to uh, think about a birdie on this one. Well, if he wants to hang with uh, the young sweet, he better he better be thinking birdie because I think that's what Jesper going to be thinking. No doubt about that. And the champ probably wants to show off a little bit here. He's got room. Go, 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 go. Mm. Uh, that'll do. That'll do. Right up near Barry in the shortcut. Yes. Okay, a little kroner hanging on this. What's he got? <laughs> He's high. Oh, did he kiss? I, maybe, he kissed. Maybe not. Oh, yeah. Oh, okay. And he kissed a tree on the left right. side of the fairway, dropped straight down. So, uh, not not really in. Uh, I wonder if they ever fight. I mean, if things are going badly. <laughs> <you know. laughs> I'm sure he gets along with his discs very well. So, I think he maybe had the distance to, uh, to put himself in putting range, but he's certainly not going to have a, a clean look at it. Well, this would this would sure make it interesting for Rick. No, no. he's playing for par. Now, Jesper, uh, he's got a a bush in front of him. He tries to go over it and does. Nice job. Raise it right up. Can certainly. And take a good run at this one, and just a little off. Well, that was longer than it looked, really. I mean, he had to really make an effort. That was on the outside of his range, for sure. Well, and Barry, who normally likes to straddle putt, obviously he's going to not have to change that here, but he's got a little bit of a bush to think about there. But he goes straight at it, oh, and nice. he puts it in. Oh. That was impressive. Great birdie. What a tremendous player he's turned out to be. Well, the crowd's getting a bit of a show here now. And they've got this uh, third place race to look at, too. That we do. So the lone birdie for Barry will put him at 56 under par. So we move on to hole number seven. Again, this is a, a variation of the permanent hole number one on what's called the monster course. 410 feet to the pin, but in order to get there, you've got to get through a narrow gap and brave some very thick rough. Now, all these guys can reach it, and yeah. for a righty, it's a roll curve right lined up at the opening. Now, great job by our camera crew. You can see that Barry's going to have a good look at it. What do you think, Kenny, going, going actually into the gap? Wow. Now, I guess maybe he's trying to lay up right outside. Going a short way. Ooh, he's a little long. Well, that was interesting. Yeah, it uh, looks like he wasn't trying to get in the gap. Maybe he was just trying no, to sit down no, right in front of it there. Not at all. Thought maybe he had a trick disc <laughs> pulled out of the bag there. Dr. Rick looking to just lay up at the uh, at the base of the hill so he has a clean look at it. Those are the ones where Rick, I, I think, really analyzes it pretty well as to whether it is a legitimate birdie opportunity or not. 
Wow. Yes, first thinking. Let's go in there. Wow. When you've got that kind of arm, it's hard to, to want to lay up on these holes. And what a beautiful day here. You know, Dan, we, we really haven't talked much about the parks here, which are just incredible. Hudson Mills Park, over 1,500 acres in this park. And uh, as, as big as that is, I'm sure there are very few cities that have parks that big. Uh, well, they've really been great to us this week, and the permanent courses here have, have become extremely popular, and you can see why. Well, and we're hoping we'll get another one at Kensington. Kensington, Dan, over 4,000 acres. Most places would have turned it into a small town, but it is just incredible facilities that we've enjoyed all week. So, nobody able to get home yet. Jesper will move a little dead wood. There's you know what and he's looking like he may have a little shot at a birdie here wow that was that's ready to need it for sure you know that was pretty risky absolutely but he's uh, not looking to do any laying up as Barry scores again that's his par, Jesper's par, and par's around the horn as we will move on to hole number eight. 250 feet this time. And as we've seen before, uh, several ways to get to the hole, none of them easy, and all of them involving some danger. The map showing us the I think what's generally the preferred route, wide left to right around the outside. Well, they've had a series of left to right curves here for these right-handed throwers. Oh, making them work. Ken and Barry take about the same line. And, uh, Ken, oh! Wow. <laughs> I said he wanted to show off. We almost got to see a hole-in-one. You know, Dan, he, he did get a hole-in-one at the U.S. Disc Golf Championships last year at Winthrop, uh, Winthrop University in North Carolina, and that shot Very made it onto shot. national TV. Uh, on the golf show. Uh, actually, CBS, I believe oh, it really? was, on one of their little golf updates, showed uh, Ken Climo's disc golf hole-in-one on a national ball golf broadcast. Well, he almost got a chance for another one. Yes, Bert takes the more direct approach, and he's going to like that. You can see these greens are not very big and not very forgiving. Hmm, thick rough pretty much on all sides here. Dr. Rick could sure stand. Rick could use that. And he gets and it. got it. It's feeling good. That's Barry for par. And now Jesper will need to get his birdie to stay a stroke ahead of Dr. Rick here. These guys are having a real battle. The youngest and the oldest. No kidding. 19 for Jesper, 51 for Dr. Rick. And again, should Jesper be able to hang on to third, that would be the best ever finish by a non-North American player. Of course, the best finish ever by a non-US player. Abba, abba. <laughs> Second place by Mike Sullivan in Toronto, oh, playing on right. his home course. That's right. With Lost to Greg pot. Hosfeld in a very exciting overtime. If you want to play safe for par, it's tough. If you want to go for it, it's a big S curve, and certainly these guys can do it. Team offers Kenny Climo. So here is Climo. Of course, the best drive we've seen all day today was by Juliana Bauer. It will be hard to get closer than that. 
Ken's got a candidate. We got it through, but it never came. <laughs> Did not come back. No. It just kept on going. He's probably Dr. Rick Mokes. Yeah. Probably close to the parking lot there. Now, what's what's Rick do? Here's one off. Uh, does he take the lane route and and play for his par, or try to make it over? Well, he knows Jesper can can birdie this hole. Uh, I think he's going for it. He's playing it. Yeah. 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 Looks like he might have gotten a good kick there, but remember there is OB down there. So now, here's back to Jesper. I guess he still has to go with his his plan. You got to figure he's going to pound this over the top. Well, he could play it a little safer now. But I don't I, see it. I don't think that's one of the options look at for that. So effortless. Oh. oh my. Well, that makes things interesting. He is not going to have a good lie. And our last thrower, Barry Schultz. Yeah. <laughs> what a great tournament for Barry. He is just a superb player. And if it hadn't been for... Ken becoming unconscious for three rounds there. It, it could be a totally different story. He's really won over a lot of people in the crowd with his, his game. The way he's handling himself this week. Flex, baby. Wide enough. It's wide enough. Oh. Just cut himself a little wood. Okay, so. Here's the situation. Jesper has a one-stroke lead. But not a good lie. Dr. Rick does not have a good lie. Jesper clearly can't see the basket from where he is. He's got a, a bush right in front of him there. Well, see, these guys are so good, they don't know anything about these kinds of shots. I mean, <laughs> my game's all about these kinds of shots, but they're Maybe. always up there looking at the basket. Maybe they should put in a pinch thrower. I'm sure he'd prefer to throw a big knife hyzer at this point, but I don't think that's available to him. He's not even sure himself. And the wind. Look at that wind, really. It's the first real wind factor we've seen all day. What's he got? He's just trying to get it up there high and let it come back, but he... Uh... Oh, must have caught something early. No, he hit the tree. Fortunately, he came down in the open there. Oh, boy. Making it exciting in the race for third place. Barry, of course, has second all to himself. And uh, not too bad a lie there. A little bit of side hill. A little bit of tree in his way. Of course, big tree up by the basket. Uh, a little deep, but certainly well within his range. Dr. Rick must have got a nice kick out of there because he's right on the fringe, pretty much in the open. This is a big shot, John. Oh, and he's not happy. Oh, man, the door was open. Well, it's not necessarily closed yet. I don't think Jesper has a, has a good shot at a par putt here. He's just going to play it safe. So he's looking pretty good for his four. If Dr. Rick has any kind of shot of a three, he could still tie Jesper. Meanwhile, Kenny doesn't really, uh, <laughs> he wasn't really in range to go for it, but he gave it a run anyway. He's there. Is that the party? Dr. Rick's last chance to tie. Aye, and it rolled away. So that should uh, seal up a historic third place for Jesper Lundmark. Dr. Rick now, his fourth shot is close. And a historic finish for Dr. Rick. Uh, what's the highest uh, finishing over 50 player in the Open, uh, John? Up to this point? <laughs> I think that's a trick question, Dan. I, I think there may never have been a 51-year-old player in the Open. And Dr. Rick finishes with the five, but a tremendous tournament. Fourth place out of a field of 240 of the sports best. Very, very impressive. And Barry finishes up his week. We're going to be seeing a lot of Barry Schultz in the next few years. That's 
got to feel good. And one single believer, that's for sure. There's Jesper with his score. What a great tournament. 19 years old from Sheleftia, Sweden. Henniger confirms the best ever finish by a player from outside of North America. We got and it. There is victory <laughs> number 10. dominance of this sport and he got pushed so hard this year uh, he really had to play great to, to get this one so. look at all the cameras this year it is unbelievable the way and calling for kudos to Team Michigan for a great job this year a lot of hugs, a lot of good feeling. A lot of people wanted to talk to Ken Flymo, and we we're going to make sure that we do that and talk to some of our other finalists coming up as this great tournament has finally come to a close. How's it feel to be 10 times world champion? Well, one better than nine, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, see if we can get that streak going again. <laughs> Please. <laughs> Colorado. Got my boy Johnny McCray. I like you already. Let the signing begin. I'm sure his wrist uh, will get a good workout <laughs> from here on out, even though the tournament's over. There's the final scoreboard. Let's talk to some of our finalists. The six courses that we played this year, which one was your favorite? It was the monster course. Really? What did you like about the monster? Long holes. <laughs> you just like to be able to throw far, is that it? Yeah. So you did a great job this year, third place. How do you feel? I feel very happy. And what do you look forward to for next year? Maybe Japan and maybe the tournament here next year in Minnesota, the Worlds. Had a good battle going there for a while. Got over to Toboggan and uh, Kenny's putter came alive from 40 and beyond. What were you thinking then? <laughs> wow. Uh, it was just unfair. He was hitting everything that he possibly could. Um, he knew the pressure was on. He's been in that situation so many times before. Uh, he knew that uh, Thursday and Fridays where a lot of things happened at the Worlds. And uh, he made a lot of clutch putts for par and for birdie. And I wasn't quite as good, but uh, had a lot of fun and played some good golf. In the year 2000, it is world title number 10 for Ken Klima. We know you were coming back hungry this year. You had a good uh, run from Barry there. When you got to the toboggan course, your putter came alive. Tell us what happened. Oh, that was probably one of the funnest rounds I've ever played. It's a really great course. Elevation changes are awesome, man. I was in some situations where I had to make some long putts, and I made probably five or six putts longer than I usually make. And it made my score a course record rather than over par and that was the difference in that round that propelled me to uh, take a two-stroke lead I believe in the tournament and have a little more confidence yeah. in the next few courses. Did you need more confidence at that point? Well you know started out a little slow and was back about 10th place five strokes back and I knew it was a long tournament you know five strokes isn't that much but I like to get a strong start and confidence is a good thing putter gets hot you get confident. Yeah. State of Michigan for having some great parks, some great courses. Everything was a lot of fun out there, guys. Thanks.
and we had a great week here in Ann Arbor. We had a couple days of rain to start out, but the weather cleared up for us and stayed that way till the end. These parks were unbelievable. We had tremendous support from Discraft and our other sponsors, the PDGA and Team Michigan did a great job putting this event together. It really was an impressive concerted effort and the result was something that's historic. To have the chance to have the AMs and the pros together in these great courses, it was something special. We may never see anything like it again. Don't forget some of our players will be moving on to the World Games in Akita, Japan next year, but we'll see you at the 2001 PDJ World Championships in Minnesota. He's Dan Roddick. And that makes him John Houck. And we'll see you next year in Minnesota. <laughs> I'm just a slob. I get, get, barely. But I feel 